Is that it? Ready for the word? Yeah. Okay. So this is called uh, For You, Not Against You. Hey. Um, and uh, God is, God is uh, this you might recall if you're, if you're a Bible reader, this is from uh, Romans chapter 8 where God says, you know, if, if God is for you, who can be against you, right? You're familiar with that one? All right. So actually, I have, I have to stop for a minute. Are you, how are you doing, Amanda? I'm, I'm completely doing something out of order right now. Your test came out really good. How's things going still? How's things going still? 15 days, no seizures. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to spring that on you in front of everybody. Okay, okay, is it okay to say that? Okay. No, I feel wonderful. I have not felt this So you've had a lot, kind of a history of seizures. And 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 then you got prayer here. What three weeks ago, maybe? Uh, Two yeah, weeks ago. About, about a month ago okay. With, um, Grace and Carol. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. All right. And then uh, went to the, for, for doctor tests. Well, my still speechless. Yeah, he's. <laughs> tests came back completely normal now. Yeah. Completely normal. No. <laughs> so we Fifteen days, no seizures. <clears throat> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I kept feeling like we needed to share that, but I hadn't cleared it with you beforehand, so I was like, okay, thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Whew, that's so good. Yeah. So anyway, uh, where was that? For you, not against you. Yeah, Romans 8, there's a verse there where, where God says, you know, if God be for you, who can be against you, right? And so, uh, you know, as I was waiting on the Lord yesterday what to share, uh, you know, he began to speak to me about that verse again and the importance of knowing that God is for us, right? The, of getting that deep, deep into our heart and just knowing it because that'll make you confident. It'll set you free, right? It'll just, it'll help you in so many ways to know that God is for you. Have clarity on that. Uh, and, and then I began to think, well, I think I actually have a message by that title, and I looked in my notes on my computer, and about three and a half years ago, I had one, you know, so I, I pulled it out and just kind of revamped a little bit with some fresh insights. So uh, here, here's the idea. Let's start in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and I wanted to get it deep in our hearts because it gives you confidence, it gives you clarity, it gives you freedom to know that God is for you, for you, for you, not against you. And, and it's important because uh, I, how many have ever struggled with the idea, like if God is really all the way for you, right? Yeah, I, I know it's a common thing. I know it. I, there was a real season in my life, a long season, where I just really struggled with clarity on that. Is God really for me or is, you know, is, is he not and is there a reason? Um, so I had, to, I had to go into the Bible and really, really get it deep into my heart. And it's empowering. It truly is. And it's absolutely scripturally right. So let's start here. Romans 8. 28, uh, Apostle Paul writing again, the book of Romans, which is a brilliant, brilliant explanation of what Jesus has done for us uh, on the cross and the resurrection and what that gives us. And Romans chapter 8 is like the pinnacle, it's the peak of this whole thing, and it tells us, you know, what, how amazing God's love is and what he's done for us. And it's, to me, even proof of the inspiration of the scripture that you read Romans 8, what God has done for it for us, man would never come up with that. Man, would come, man comes up with religion, but man would never come up with what God has actually done for us, right? It's that powerful. So he says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And ordinarily, I like the New King James Version. I, I, I use that quite a bit. It's a good translation overall. But this particular verse has better translations. Uh, if you look in the, in the original, in the Greek, um, it actually says that God causes all things to work together. And, I, you know, and, and we can get that. We know that all things work together. We know that's not just a mystical, universal truth. God does it, right? God causes things to work together. But the, the original Greek actually says that very clearly. It uses the word synergize. You know that? We, were, we use that word today, right? Yeah, it's become an English word. It means things work together. Uh, and it says that God synergizes all things for our good if we love him and we're called by him, right? Isn't that cool? Yeah. So what that means, though, is that God is so for us that the moment you say yes to him, right, he is, he is ta taking everything that was in your life, good and bad and otherwise, and there was bad in our lives because free will is a messy thing, right? We live in a messy and broken world, and there was good and there's bad, and God takes all those things and began to, to work in them and work through them for your good so that you will turn out amazing, right? And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and even... Uh, what this even means is that if you make a mistake, something goes wrong, 
right? God still can redeem it, right? Because we know, I mean, we make mistakes, right? Things go wrong, and when, or maybe somebody else does something, you know, it messes you up. But, but God is saying, anything that goes wrong in this messy free will world, right, give it to me and I can still work it for good. Right? It's almost like if you're, if, you know, if you're trying to drive somewhere and you got the GPS and it says, you know, go straight and you accidentally turn right, you know, and then the GPS says, recalculating, right? I'm going to still get you there. You just took a wrong turn, right? That's what, the, this, that's what this is saying. God's saying, if you took a wrong turn, recalculating, we'll, we'll get you there, right? Just keep, keep walking with me, right? I'm going to work everything for your good. And <laughs> yeah, and he's able to do that in a free will world. What a cool, cool thing. Keep going. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. All right? So, whom God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed. In other words, he predestined you to become like Jesus. Become like Jesus? Yeah. To have resurrection, immortality, right? To be younger brothers and sisters to Jesus, who is a man, but he's God incarnate, right? And, uh, and he came, and as a man, right, he becomes literally our, not only our savior, but like our older brother. And as we get born again, we become his younger brothers and sisters. You're destined to become like him in nature, in character, in resurrection, immortality, right? You're in love. You're going to be a lot like Jesus, beloved sons and daughters of God. And it says that whom God foreknew, he predestined. And I'm, I'm thinking that God foreknew everybody, you know, I mean, was anybody like a surprise? You, you know, you showed up and God said, where did you come from? You know, like, <laughs> didn't see that one coming, right? So that's not the way it works, right? He knew, he foreknew, and he predestined you. He predestined everybody, but we have to say yes. We have to say, that's our part. We have to say yes. If we don't say yes to it, we don't get it. Because, you know, that free will thing, right? We say yes, and instantly all of this becomes ours, and God starts working in our life, right? Go ahead. Moreover, whom he predestined, he also called, and whom he called, he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Speaking of what Jesus did for us on the cross and the resurrection and, and the finished work of Christ, and he says, God's saying in his heart and in his mind, you're already done. When Jesus accomplished it on the cross and when God planned it in his mind and in his heart, said it's already done, I just need you to say yes to it. We're walking through it in time and we're going to experience the fullness of it as we, as we get there, right? But in God's heart, it's done. It's done, right? Yeah. He says all you, your part is say yes to him and keep walking with him and he will get you there. Whew. So God apparently is for us, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, so that's what he's saying. He's making this point. God is really for us. What, should, what then shall we say to these things? Everything that God is doing for us. If God is for us, who can be against us? <laughs> well, there's, there's two answers to that question. If God is for us, he is. Who can be against us? Well, many people can be against us. The devil's against us. Is the devil a real, yeah, he's, he's a real rebel angel, right? Yeah. The Bible says that there was, God created angels and some of them rebelled and chiefly one called Lucifer, who became, you know, what we call the devil. And uh, yeah, he's still around and he's on a leash and he has limited power, but he's still around and, you know, and uh, he's against us, huh? Yeah. And if you're, yeah, if you walk with Jesus, you sometimes you experience <laughs> some of that, you know, he throws some stuff at you. Uh, how about sometimes other people are against us? You know, there's, there's things that can be against us, right? But the, what he's really saying here is if God is for us, who can really prevail against us? No one. Who can really stop us? No one, right? Nobody can. So if, God, if God's for you and if you say yes to God, you agree, you and God are a majority. <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, go ahead. Uh, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He who did not spare his own son. Wow, talking about giving Jesus on the cross, right? And that's, that's either either terrible or wonderful, right? I wouldn't give my son to die for anybody, you know, on a cross. I wouldn't do that, but God did. But guess what? Jesus isn't a separate person. Jesus is God. God is a triune God, Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And, and God the Father and Jesus the Son did this by agreement, right? And God is, is, is redeeming us in the person of Jesus, right? To, you know, for, for his purpose. So Jesus does, does this on the cross for us. I'll get more into that in a moment. And so this is a wonderful thing, right? He delivered him up for us all. So how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He said, if I, if I gave my son for you 
Am I holding anything else back? No, <laughs> right? Jesus even said, don't be afraid, little flock. It's my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Okay? All, all that God has created, we're going to reign and rule with Jesus. The Bible says that, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and God says, it's all yours. It's all yours. You're the sons and daughters of God. Everything is yours, you know, by, by family, by relationship, by covenant. It's all yours, you know. Go ahead. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Okay, here's where I read, I read a lot of that kind of to get to this too. So that, that basic idea, if God is for us, who can be against us? What, can, what shall we say to this? So there's three questions now. In, in the next, this verse and the next two verses, there's three questions. And these questions are super powerful, super, super um, empowering and, and uh, liberating. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Well, God's elect is you and me, right? Anybody who says yes to Jesus. So who's going to bring a charge against you? Who's going to accuse you successfully? Right? Well, the answer is, it is God who justifies. So what he's saying is, God is the one who justified you. Because of Christ on the cross, his shed blood, his sacrifice for you, you are justified, you're forgiven, you're clean, you're as if you stand before God as if you had never sinned. Right? That's what Jesus has done for you. An amazing, amazing thing. It's God who did that for you. It's God who justifies so who's going to bring a charge against you successfully? Anybody? Anybody? No, it's not going to work, right? Sometimes, as Christians, we get, maybe just because of bad teaching and religion and our own weird thoughts, sometimes we think that God is accusing us, right? God is bringing a charge against us. Oh, I know God's mad at me. I know I've messed up. I know that, you know. Would God simultaneously bring a charge against you and justify you? you know, in other words, would he justify you fully on the cross and then bring a charge against you? Well, that would be double-minded and crazy, wouldn't it? That's not how this works. God's single-minded. He knows what he's doing. He stands behind it. He justified you. So no charge against you stands. Right? Okay. All right. Uh, hmm. So will God correct us? Yes, of course he will correct us. We correct our own children, our grandchildren, or whatever, right? Of course he, he loves us and he'll correct us. But correction is not a charge, an accusation, or a condemnation. Correction is love. For children, right? For his children. So I remember um, years ago, I, I want to I share kind of a little vision that I had years ago because it'll tie in with this passage. Um, I, we were in uh, a previous place, not this building, it was a little rental place over on Apache Trail, and I was praying in the afternoon there one time, and I kind of paced back and forth when I pray, and, and, and I remember it very, very well. And the Lord brought me into kind of a visionary experience. It happens once in a while. And I saw God on the throne you know, and his great majesty and love and glory and, you know, so he got on the throne and, but then I see a curtain in front of him, you know, like you have to pass through the curtain to get there, to get to the throne. And, uh, and as I get closer and see this more clearly, I realize that the curtain is red and it's flowing, which is the blood of Jesus, right? It's the blood of Jesus. And I know this is, this is symbolic. Sometimes God shows you things in a symbolic way, right? So it's not that I think there's a curtain in front of his throne. It's a symbolic picture. But it's red, it's flowing, and it's the blood of Jesus. And in that moment, God spoke to me as a minister, you know, and he said, get them to come to me. Get them to come through the blood of Jesus. And then I can fix anything. You got to get that. You got to process it because it's so powerful. Get them to come to me through the blood of Jesus, and then I can fix anything. And that's so powerful because, you know, even as Christians, we tend to sort of, there's a little part of our thinking maybe that will go towards, well, this person is hopeless, that person is hopeless, this one's too broken, this group of people can never be saved, this group of people, they can never be saved, right? And God said, bring them through the blood, bring them to me. If they'll come through the blood, I can fix anything. God, it is God who justifies. <laughs> and then when God justifies you, who's going to bring a charge against you? <laughs> it ain't happening, right? Again, if, if we need correction, should we get correction? Yes. But that's a different thing. Okay. All right, go ahead. 34. Um, who is he who condemns? Here's our second question. Who is the one who condemns? How many of us Christians, you've, you've felt condemned before? You've felt kind of a voice, a, a, a condemnation coming at you, right? Absolutely, yeah. And uh, this is one of, one of the devil's really, really favorite tools. I mean, he's got several, but this is, one of, this is one of the big ones, right? He'll throw condemnation at you. 
right? And condemnation it will deflate you and discourage you and, you know, make you feel ashamed and guilty and hopeless and all kinds of things. And sometimes, again, bad teaching or our own thoughts or religion, when condemnation hits, we sometimes think that it's God, you know? And if you've ever been in a church where they hurled condemnation at you from the pulpit, right, then you got trained to think it was God, right? And so the question here is, who's the one condemning? Is it God? And the answer is no, because it's Christ who died for you. It's Christ who has risen and is even now at the right hand of God the Father making intercession for you. Why would he simultaneously die for you, make intercession for you, testify of your forgiveness, and then condemn you at the same time? How could he possibly do that? That's double-minded, right? God says, no, I'm very single-minded. I justified you. Died, risen, seated at the right hand of the Father, finished. You're justified. You stand clean in my sight. There is no condemnation for you in Christ. Again, will he correct us? Yes. It's a very different thing. How do you recognize the difference? Correction, when I get corrected by God, and sometimes I do, it feels like love. <laughs> you know, still tells me something I'm doing wrong and to, you know, to correct it, but it feels like love. He's saying, son, you know, come up to who you really are, right? Yeah, yeah, know who you really are, and, and this, isn't, this isn't worthy of you, you know, it's like change this behavior or whatever it is, you know. Um, but when God corrects us, it's always hopeful, it's always back on track, it's always uplifting, and it feels like love, even though it's correction. When condemnation comes, it's hopeless, it's defeating, it's discouraging, it's deflating, it's shame, it's guilt, right? Big difference. And so God is saying, learn the difference when condemnation comes at you, recognize it for what it is. In the name of Jesus, get out, yes. right? I can be corrected, but I won't be condemned. Amen? Yeah, because it's inconsistent. God's, all, God's totally for you. That's the question. If God's for you, who can be against you, right? Know that, know that, know that. Go ahead, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? The implied answer is no. The question is, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Hmm. Yeah. Can anything, once you have said yes to Jesus, can anything separate you from God's love? It turns out there's only one thing, and it's you yourself. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. There's other things that will try, but nothing can successfully do it unless you allow it to happen. Yeah, I'll get there. I'll get there. <laughs> but what's gonna, what can separate us from it? If, if, he has, if he has justified us, saved us, and poured his love on us, what can possibly separate us from that? Nothing. Right? And, and then he asks his question, tribulation or persecution? And the reason for that is because at the time this is written, 2,000 years ago, Christians are experiencing persecution. Right? Christians are being fed to lions in Roman arenas because they're not worshiping Caesar. Right? And, and uh, he's asking this question, can these things really defeat you or destroy you? The answer is no. The worst they can do is send you to heaven early. <laughs> right? And we still win, right? Still win. <laughs> All right, go ahead. <coughs> as it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Well, that don't sound like good news. What's that about? It's an Old Testament prophecy that says, right, that God's people experience persecution in this world, right? Ah, and, and they were experiencing it, right? Go ahead. Uh, yet, nevertheless, in all these things, whatever comes against you, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. <laughs> we win. We win. Yep. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can prevail against us? Who can really stop us? That, that's the idea. If God is for you, can anybody actually stop you? Spiritual, physical, anything, anybody. Can anybody actually stop you? No. Only you yourself can do it. If God is for you, right? So uh, keep going. Paul said, I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Keep going, please. For height, neither uh, height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. No created thing, whether that's time, angels, demons, right? Uh, powers, people, any, no created thing can separate you from the love of God. God's the creator. So what created thing could defeat him? What created thing could defeat his purpose? If he's set his love upon you, he's redeemed you through Jesus, right? What can really stop you? Absolutely nothing, except yourself, if you vote against yourself. Whew. Well, that's pretty powerful stuff, huh? Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> look at, uh, well, well, okay. Look at Revelation 12.10. So if the question is, if God is for you, uh, who can be against you? Uh, there, it turns out there are some things or beings that are against you, right? Yeah. One of them is that rebel angel called Satan. And uh, in Revelation 12.10, we have that one there. I think it's gone. Did it disappear? Revelation 12.10. There it is. Thank you. All right. So this is speaking about the return of the Lord and, uh, and what happens when the Lord returns, but it, but it deals with uh, this rebel angel, Satan. It says, now, uh, John said, now I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. It's the devil's end, right? But it calls him the accuser of the brethren. When Jesus comes back, he's done for. God puts his foot on his neck and says, you're done, right? But he, meanwhile, he's called the accuser, the accuser. He accuses us before God, right? And he accuses us to ourselves, and he accuses us to each other. He's the accuser. It's what he does. So if, uh, can he accuse us before God? Will that accomplish anything? Uh, well, we just read Romans 8. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Since it's God who justifies no accusation against you will stand. You know, whenever the devil says, I, you know, I, I accuse this person, look what they did. And God says, well, I, I see them washed in the blood, um, so get out of here. Right? <laughs> get out of here. <sighs> no accusation before God will stand. He's the justifier. Uh, how about uh, when, when the devil accuses us, though, do you ever feel, take, kind of take in that accusation against yourself, right, and start to let it really eat on you and work at you? Yeah, yeah. That, that sometimes can really deflate us and bring us down, right? And God is saying, don't let it. Don't let it. You know, if you need to correct yourself in something, should you? Yes. That's called good character for starters, right? <laughs> yeah, if we've done something wrong, yes, absolutely. Deal with it, confess it, fix it. If we've done something wrong to another person, should we fix it? Yes, good character, yes. But are we condemned? Are we done? No, no, no. So uh, how about, you know, the enemy even accuses us to each other too, you know, starts whispering, you know what so-and-so did to you, what so-and-so said about you, and, you know, gets people divided against each other. That's the accuser. Don't let him do that. Well, what if, what if somebody has done me wrong? then be a grown-up and talk to them. Or let it go. What it, whichever is appropriate, you know, be a grown-up and talk to them. <laughs> right? Deal with it, fix it, or let it go. Right? But, no, we don't do that, right? right? That's the accuser. So, yeah, I mean, the enemy is against us, but can he stop us? No, he absolutely cannot stop us. We're justified with God. Can, can he throw junk in our path and slow us down? Yeah, it turns out, yeah, he can do that. It seems like he can do that, right? Yeah, we've we got to deal with some of that. Um, here's, here's something that uh, the Lord impressed on me years ago that uh, is really kind of a powerful thought. Uh, remember when Jesus is beginning his ministry? He's 30 years old. He goes to the River Jordan. He's baptized, filled with the Spirit. He begins his ministry. But the moment he's baptized, right, it says that the heavens opened and the Father spoke to him in an audible voice and said, you are my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased, right? And the Father is giving Jesus his identity as a man on earth. You're my beloved son. And, uh, and Jesus is receiving that, and everybody's hearing that. And he's got his purpose in front of him now, his life, his ministry in front of him as the Son of God. And it says that the next thing that happens, Jesus goes into a time of testing, and the devil comes to him and says, are you really the Son of God? If you're really the Son of God, you know, turn this stone into bread or whatever, you know. Uh, so... What's the point of that? The very thing that God just confirmed about Jesus, the devil came immediately and tries to question it, twist it, tear it down, right? Huh, okay. So what does that have to do with you and me? Turns out that the very thing that God has called you to do is the thing that Satan will tell you you can't do. Amen. And the very thing that, that Satan is telling you you can never become is the very thing that you're called to become, probably. And the thing that Satan is telling you you can never have it's probably the very thing that God wants you to have, <laughs> right? Well, why is that allowed to even happen? Because it turns out that, that part of this deal is for us. We grow in this struggle. We grow by, by reading God's word and his truth and embracing it and believing it and right, walking in it, right? Believing it on purpose and walking into our destiny. That's part of, that's part of our training. It really is, right? 
And so you, you just got to know that. And we don't get our marching orders from the devil. Whatever he's telling me, you know, I can't have its opposite day. No, we get our marching orders from God. But it's a confirmation that often the very thing the enemy is trying to tear you down in is the very thing that you're called to do and be. Yeah, pretty interesting stuff. So he's against you. He can't stop you, but he can throw junk in your path. All right. Um, how about uh, who else is against you? If God be for you, who can be against you? I got another thing that's, that the Bible says is against you, and it's going to shock some of you. Shock you. Shocking, shocking. And it's going to be fun for me. So <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually the law of God given through Moses, right? It's called, it's called the, the Ten Commandments and the laws of God and the Old Covenant. The Bible says that it's against you. It's not for you. What can that be? The Bible's all the Bible. I thought God's commandments were given to help us. No, they're not. Trust me, they're not really. Uh, I'll show you why. Uh, where are we? Deuteronomy 31. Starts in verse 24. This is when uh, God gave his Ten Commandments and gave his laws and his covenant through Moses. And Israel is ready to go into the promised land. And Moses is reviewing the law with them. And he says, here's my laws, right? So... It says, so it was when Moses had completed writing the words of this law in a book, by the way, which is Genesis through Deuteronomy, uh, that when they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, take this book of the law, right? And, and that's, that's Genesis through Deuteronomy, right? That's the Ten Commandments and all the commandments of the law. Take this book of the law, put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a, what does that say? Witness, Witness against you. What? Huh, well, that's pretty interesting. Why is that? Uh, the law had a couple of purposes. Uh, one of the purposes of the Ten Commandments is in that part of man's early history, man was already falling into sin and darkness so much they're suppressing the knowledge of Right, what's good and bad, right and wrong, moral and immoral, they're suppressing that knowledge, right? And there was really very little moral compass going on in the world. God calls a covenant people called Israel, and he says, okay, here's, I got some laws for you, listen up, right? For starters, you shall not murder, you know? And they go, what? Yeah, don't get mad at somebody and kill them. Is that a problem? Is that wrong? Yes. <laughs> I'm serious. They didn't have a moral compass. I mean, you know, it's like the Wild West kind of, you know, devolving. And God says, no, murder is wrong. Oh, okay. What else is wrong? He gives, he gives these laws of, he's introducing them to a moral code that they had really kind of lost, you know. And, but, but furthermore, the law also is a witness against us now, right? Because the law couldn't give you life. God didn't just give us rules and we say, oh, we follow the rules successfully and we're all doing great now. We're all going to heaven. No, that's not how it works. The law tries us and convicts us in God's court because everybody sins, everybody falls short, right? Yeah, and because uh, we're, you know, human race infected with sin. Everybody falls short, everybody sins. And so you picture yourself in the court, the court of God, the heavenly court of God, and God, is the, God the Father is the judge, right? And there we all are, and it's our trial. And Jesus is our lawyer. And Jesus stands up and says, Father, here are my clients. They're all guilty. They're all guilty. And they all deserve death. Let me die for them. And our lawyer dies for us. And God says, case dismissed. If you accept what Jesus has done for you, case dismissed. If you don't accept what he's done for you, we still have a problem. But if you accept what he's done for you, case dismissed. <sighs> Jump up to Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 15. Well, Paul wrote this. Uh, after the cross and the resurrection, he writes it to us as believers. And he says, you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, with Christ. 
having forgiven you some of your sins, but not, but not the really bad ones. No, no, it doesn't. It says, yeah, having forgiven you all your trespasses, all your sins. How did he do that? 14. It says, he, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. That's exactly what we just read back in Deuteronomy. The law testified against us, convicted us, pronounced us all guilty. Jesus said, let me take their punishment. And all the charges against us are nailed to the cross. Jesus dies for us. His blood runs down and washes away every charge. And the paper is white. God says, case dismissed, if you accept what Jesus has done for you. <laughs> wow. The law was against you. Now, you know, in another kind of sideline, uh, the law was part of the old covenant of Moses, right? Which ended 2,000 years ago, by the way. It was for the people of Israel, and it ended 2,000 years ago. When Jesus on the cross said, it is finished, it was over, okay? So you and I were actually never part of the old covenant, by the way. We were never even under the Ten Commandments, honestly. That was, unless you were Jewish and you lived more than 2,000 years ago, Seriously, it wasn't even our covenant. It wasn't something we were ever even under, <laughs> right? But it was how God dealt with the people to show what his plan was, right? And, uh, but then the Savior came, and he's offered to all of us, Jew and Gentile alike. Anybody who calls on Jesus is saved. <laughs> Amen. Wow. Okay. Uh, go to Philippians 3.12. Uh, another thing that was uh, against us or that could be against us sometimes is our own past, right? Yeah, so we know the devil was against us. We know the law is against us. The law of God was against us. Another thing that's against us sometimes is our own past because we, our, our past drags us down if we let it, right? Now, your past can't stop you if you accept what Jesus has done for you. If you trust what Jesus has done for you, your past cannot stop you. But if you don't trust that and understand that, you'll drag your past around like a ball and chain, right? And it's not even locked. You know, it's not even locked. You know, when you forgive things of the past, when you accept his forgiveness for you, when you let the past be the past, washed away in the blood of Jesus, right? Your past cannot stop you. But if you define yourself by it and drag it around, it can stop you, but you're letting it, okay? Paul said, uh, in Philippians, again, uh, 3.12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Yeah, I'm not perfect yet. I'm still in process, but I've come through the blood. God's fixing everything in me, right? And, and I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on. That means move forward so I can lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. His purpose for me, his calling for me, I want it. I'm going for it, right? So I press on. Go ahead. 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. I'm not all the way there yet. But one thing I do, notice what it said, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Yeah. So Paul is saying, you know what? Your past can't stop you. My past can't stop me. And I understand. I, I let it go. I let it go. And, you know, someone might say, well, but, but Pastor, I, I just messed up five minutes ago. Right? Five minutes ago, I screwed up really bad. Right? And I would say to you, isn't five minutes ago still the past? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so let it go. <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, again, if I, if I need to be corrected in something, is that okay? Sure. If I need to fix something with somebody, I hurt them, I did, should I fix that? Yes. Good character, for starters. But are you condemned? Are you guilty? Are you done? Is it over? No. No. God says, leave it behind. Fix it. Deal with it. And then leave it behind move forward. I'm always for you. We're recalculating the path again, <laughs> right? Recalculating the GPS, we're recalculating. Okay, keep going forward, right? Your past is washed away, even if it was five minutes ago. Five hours, five days, five weeks, five months, five years. <laughs> um, something else that sometimes is against us, other people, right? Other people can be against us. Some of, some, of, uh, some of the baggage that we carry around, much of our adult life is from childhood things when somebody, you know, kind of poured negativity into us in some way and did some damage. And uh, we carry that around for years and years and years and years. You know, can it stop us? No, no. You forgive, you get healed, you let it go, you move forward, right? 
Uh, but uh, even now, how many times now somebody's against you right now? Yeah, maybe for no good reason. You know, uh, what do we do? Jesus experienced this. What he did is amazing. It's a great model for us. Luke 23, 33 to 34. Hey, did somebody just, just come against you and just mess you up somehow? You're right. They're just, yeah, they're doing you some harm or they're, they're trying to stop you. They're trying to mess you up, whatever it may be. Look what happened to Jesus, right? Jesus is wonderful in every way. He loves people. He's healing people. He's speaking truth. Some people got mad at him because of power, politics, jealousy, whatever. The religious leaders decide to crucify him, put him on a cross to die, completely unjust. We use that term crucified even today, right? Well, I got crucified there. I mean, somebody really attacked me, right? Or, you know, but Jesus was actually crucified, completely unjustly, hanging there on a cross, nailed, suffering, but he's there by his own choice. Is he angry? Is he going to get revenge? Is he going to say, I'm going to blast you guys? No. They're, they're against him. They decided to be against him. They decided to even kill him. And look what he does as he's hanging there. They place, they they, they came to the place called Calvary. There they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on his left. Verse 34. And then Jesus said, hanging there and bleeding, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What? <laughs> not revenge, not anger, not if you're against me, I'm against you. No, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's hanging there. What does that have to do with us? <laughs> We'll get there. In other words, when they were decided they were against Jesus, Jesus said, you may be against me, but I'm not against you. You may be against me, but I'm still for you. And even if you're the one crucifying me, I'm still shedding my blood for you. And if you ask for my forgiveness before your last breath, you still get it. I still want you with me forever. I'm still for you. I'm still willing to forgive you. I'm paying for it now. Even if you're the one crucifying me, I'm for you. Accept me with your last breath and you're still mine. What does this mean for us? If somebody's against you, you don't have to be against them. Be for them. Pray for them. Want the best for them, right? You know, is it okay to set boundaries sometimes? Yes. Yes, that's a different matter. But I'm not against you, I'm for you. <laughs> Can anybody stop you? Can anybody, the devil, the law, your past, other people, can anybody stop you? No, no. Can anybody separate you from the love of God? No. Can anybody condemn you, accuse you, or? No, they cannot, they cannot. Uh, the only one, it turns out, who can is you. So are you for you or are you against you? And that's a real question, though, because when we grow up in this world and somebody poured a lot of negativity into us, you know what we do? We internalize it. We come into agreement with it. And at some point, after you've internalized enough of that negativity, criticism, harshness, whatever it is, abuse, I don't know, whatever it is, you hit a certain age, you look in the mirror and you go, I hate you. You look in the mirror and say, I don't like you. You're stupid. You're ugly. Who could love you? You do everything wrong. There's something wrong with you. You don't belong. You don't fit in. You're not good enough. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yep. Okay, yes. Why would a human being look in the mirror and say, I hate you. I reject you. What kind of damage has to happen to somebody before they will do that? And that's exactly the world we live in. And that's what Satan wants you to believe. That's what Satan wants you to do is reject yourself, hate yourself, condemn yourself. Does God want that for you? Please say no. <laughs> No, I mean, does Jesus die on the cross for you so that you can look in the mirror and hate yourself? No. no. He says, if I'm for you, can you also be for yourself, please? Yes. Can you vote for yourself? Yes. Yeah, yeah, right? Again, if I've done something wrong, should I admit it? Yes. Should I correct it? Yes. Good character? Yes. But don't hate yourself, don't reject yourself, don't condemn yourself. Uh, Remember those passages, you know, who could bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justified. Well, we could bring a charge against ourselves. We do it, don't we? Yeah. There's a difference between correcting myself and bringing a charge against myself. Charge against myself is I'm so stupid and I did it wrong again. Correcting myself is I did it wrong, but I'm going to fix it. Yep. Right? All right. Uh, how about who is he who condemns? That was the second question. Who condemns you? Because it's God who justifies you, right? 
So do we ever condemn ourselves? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. I, I, want, I want to tell you, um, you know, I want to give you a little piece of, of gentle advice. Um, never, 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 never do that to yourself again. Okay? Just don't do that ever again. Ever, ever, ever. Okay? Ever. Just don't do it. <laughs> okay? Don't look in the mirror and hate yourself, condemn yourself, judge yourself. Correct yourself, yes. But look in the mirror and say, I'm for you. You know why? God's for me first, right? So I agree. I'm in. Do you, you know, if God's for you, do you really want to argue with him on that? Do God say, I'm for you, and you say, well, I'm against me. We're going to have an argument. Do you really want to have that argument with God? Do you really want to win that argument? No. <laughs> God's for you. You say, I, I'm in. I agree. Died for you. Shed my blood for you. Rose. Justified you. Seated you at my right hand. Give you eternal life. Forgiveness. Glory. Immortality. Family. Be my beloved son and daughter. Are you in? Well, I don't know if I'm worthy of that. I don't know if I can have that. <clears throat> say yes. Be smart enough to say yes to that. <laughs> Right? Just say yes. Just be smart enough to say yes to that. Right? Be your own friend. Seriously, vote for yourself. I know that sounds weird if you, if you got religious background, but I'm absolutely serious. I think it's completely scriptural, completely biblical. God's for you, so agree with him. Amen? Just agree with him. Doesn't mean be arrogant or proud. Just means agree with him. Right? Yeah. So... You know, the, 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 the third question was, who can separate us from the love of God, right? Can anything, can anyone actually separate us from the love of God once you've come to Christ? The answer is no, except you could do it. One way we could do it ultimately is to say no to Jesus. If you just say no to Jesus, I don't want you, I refuse, I will not. We can separate ourselves from the love of God. Free will is messy. Free will has real consequences. But, but here's another thought for Christians who, if you say yes to Jesus, here's another thought for you. Sometimes we temporarily separate ourselves from the experience of his love. Sometimes we temporarily separate ourselves from the feeling of his love because we're doing that again. We're judging ourselves, condemning ourselves, beating ourselves up, counting ourselves unworthy. And we temporarily separate ourselves from the experience of his love, even though his love is pouring out on us at the moment. His love is actually surrounding us and pouring out upon us. And when we do that, we, you get what I'm saying, okay? Don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah, but I messed up again. Yeah, but it's the past. Well, it was five minutes ago. It's still the past. Accept forgiveness. Fix a mess if you need to. If you need to fix something, fix it. But receive his love. Amen? Embrace his love, let him be for you, trust that he's for you, and be for yourself. I'm forgiven, I'm going forward, okay? God always has wonderful plans for you. He always has more for you, more blessing, more goodness, more love, more future. He always does. He always does. Embrace it, right? Embrace it, go with it, absolutely. Yeah, the vote is yours. God's already voted. He voted 2,000 years ago. It was a great big yes, vote for you. Agree with him. Vote for yourself. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Should we pray? Hmm. Let's stand together for a moment and uh, just take two or three minutes and position ourselves for God to touch us one more time, for God to speak into our hearts. Hmm. So if you tune your ears right now to God, he actually in these moments will kind of whisper to you. God speaks to us many times in inspired thoughts, but it's him, it's him. And so we want to uh, just take a few moments and receive, not just pray a closing prayer and run, run out, but take a few moments and receive now. Let him touch you, let him speak into your heart. God, thank you, thank you that you are for us, not against us. And you want us to have clarity and confidence on that. That what you did on the cross was an absolute vote for us. Case dismissed, I'm for you, I love you, you're mine forever. Whew. Holy Spirit, come and pour into each one of us right now. Come and fall upon us, 
draw us close to your heart, draw us into your embrace right now. Holy Spirit, welcome. Touch us, breathe on us. Minister to everyone here. If you're in uh, general agreement with what I've shared here, I want to lead you in a prayer, ask you to join me and uh, say, Jesus, you're for me, not against me. So I say yes to you. Come into my heart. And I receive and believe that you're for me. You voted for me. And I come into agreement. I vote for myself. <laughs> to receive all of your goodness. Your love, forgiveness, eternal life with you. Yes, 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 Jesus, yes. Yeah. Nothing can stop me. Nothing can separate me. Nothing can condemn me. God has justified me. But in the name of Jesus, all self-rejection, self-hatred, get out of me now. In the name of Jesus, I break agreement with that and I cast it out. Holy Spirit, fill me with your love for me. I receive it and I agree with it. In Jesus' name. Oh, that's good, that's good. Just soak that in, soak that in for a minute. Just let him whisper to your heart, confirm to your heart. He's for you, he's for you. He causes all things to work for good for you, even when you've made a mistake. Recalculating. All right, going back in the right direction now. He's for you, he's for you, he's for you. The past is washed away. There's nothing against you, no accusation against you. It's washed away, it was nailed to the cross and washed in the blood of Jesus. He's for you. And you're for you also. You can look in the mirror and say, ha, I'm for you. Just ask God a, a little question just between you and him. Ask him what's something that he wants you to know right now about this, something that he wants to speak or confirm to you. And then listen to those thoughts that he brings to you. Yeah, God, what do you want to speak to each one? Holy Spirit, speak to your beloved people. Speak to each heart. We worship you. We worship you, Lord. Fill us, fill us with your spirit, God. Fill us with your love. I pray that you heal every heart, heal every soul. Make your people become mighty, mighty, mighty ambassadors of Christ who know they're loved and know they're empowered by God. Breathe on us, God. Touch us again. Touch us again. A little more. A little more. Thank you, Lord. So good, so good, God. You're so good. Drawing us close to your heart. Close to your heart. You're drawing us close. Your arms are open. Your face is full of love. 
and joy. You open your arms, you draw us close to your heart, you embrace us.